And the beauty of this, the absolute utter beauty of this, the shot in the background is a Latin class. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. <sighs> I mean, you know, not to make too much of a pun of it, but that's literally old school. <laughs> there is an assertion here of a certain way the world works, which let me tell you, ain't the way the world works anymore. And my worry is, there's an old joke from the Soviet Union. We pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. What we don't want to get into is we pretend to learn and they pretend to teach us. That's what we don't want, but that's kind of what I see going on here. Okay, so to bring this into another context of how I actually see this happening now, I want to talk about another project <laughs> that was at Young ICT Explorers last year. I didn't get to judge this one, but after I was done with judging, I went over and had a chat with them. Now, you all know Minecraft. It's the crack cocaine for the tendrils. <laughs> <laughs> there are various forms of addiction, but we all know what it is. And People, kids play Minecraft, but these kids decided they wanted to do more with that. They're really into Minecraft, but what, one thing that they really like to do with Minecraft is they like to mod or modify Minecraft. And there's, you go online, you type Minecraft modding, you get pages and pages of results. People do all sorts of things. They add weapons, they add, kitchen furniture, they had animations, it really doesn't matter. It's sort of whatever you want to add to Minecraft to make the world more yours, you can do. But in order to modify Minecraft, you have to be able to go under the hood and program Minecraft. And Minecraft is written in a programming <laughs> language called Java. Java is generally taught from the second year of university when you're getting a computer science degree. Because Java is quite complicated, it's quite formal. It uses and embodies a lot of formal programming practices and a lot of very formal ideas about how computer programs should properly be written. These kids wanted to get more kids modding Minecraft. And when they looked out at all of the sources to teach kids Java, they were just fundamentally dissatisfied. This is, this is from their website. They, they, they thought that there was nothing that would easily teach Java to kids. So what did they do? <laughs> pair learning, anyone? <laughs> That's what pair learning looks like. These kids built their own website to teach kids enough <coughs> Java that they could then write their own Minecraft mods. Because guess what? The kids were already connected because of Minecraft. There was already an opportunity to share. They took advantage of that opportunity so that kids would be able to come in and learn and then do. It's everything right there. And no one had to teach them anything formally about this. I'm just watching this. My eyes are popping out of my head because I'm going to be talking about you a lot, kids. <laughs> because it sums everything up. The kids themselves understand how this world works. They have this intuitive <coughs> sense. And it's not this digital native versus digital immigrant. It's do we understand how to make the knowledge culture work for us, or do we simply hold it at arm's length? And this is the question which now, as educators, is confronting us. I love this. This one floated by last week, and I knew that this was going to be the final listen that I was going to give you. Swap the roles. And of course, we also heard this when we were talking about coding camp, right? That if you swap the roles, if you step back and let the kids teach, they're going to learn new skills, you're going to learn new skills, everyone's going to learn a lot more. And you know that these kids, by creating this website and creating these materials, learned a lot more. Not just about Java, but about how to teach and how to learn, which makes them better learners. 
And I want to think that this isn't going to just be true in the geek subjects. It's not going to just be true in technology. It should be just as true in Shakespeare as it is in something like Dante. Why wouldn't it be? We can share. People have been sharing about Shakespeare for 400 years. We can learn. We can do. So we shouldn't let our minds be too confined by exactly what's concretely going on in front of us. We should dream. We should think openly about Okay. Now, despite the fact that this is dated the 1st of April, this article <laughs> was, in fact, serious. <laughs> the reality is that technology is doing more harm than good in our schools to education. I, I don't really have any way to critique this. Oh, no, wait, I do. Let me do some word substitution. You know who first said that? Plato, back in around 350 BC, <laughs> when he announced that poets would be crap because everyone was using books. And you don't have to go very far back to a time when people were saying this. So I have to. As angry as a comment like that makes me, and as out of tune as I think it is, I think what I actually hear is a cry for help. This is what I actually hear. The world has changed so much, so quickly. And there's just, we have to embrace that. If we deny that, we're, we're losing everything else. We have to acknowledge that the world has changed utterly, and it has changed literally overnight. You know, a kid who's going through the grades right now, so a kid who's probably, what, in year 11, would have been in year six when the iPhone was introduced, maybe year five. And so just in her lifetime, the entire relationship to how knowledge works has changed completely. And for us as educators, to be expected to be able to keep up with that is a big ask. But that's the ask that's being made of us because it is our job to make sure that these kids, when they graduate in 2025 or 26 or 2030 or 2031, that when they're walking into a world where cars drive themselves and lawyers are artificial intelligences and your doctor has a voice speaking to his ear that is far more widely read, that in that world, kids are capable of sharing their way into success. So this is the challenge, and this is the question that I'm posing to you today. When you lead, as leaders in your schools, how are you leading? Where are you leading? Are you leading by example? Are you leading them into this sharing culture? It comes down to a question of education versus teaching. Not that teaching is bad, but really what we're doing is in an information-rich world, we're helping kids to educate themselves. They're gonna need help with that. They're gonna need scaffolding. Well, guess what? So do we, and there's no sin in admitting that. There's no sin in admitting that we can use connecting and sharing and learning and doing to help us improve our own practice as educators. That in fact, we need to be doing that or else we're doing a disservice to those kids because we're not living our own lives by the same rules we're trying to bring into them. So we need to think about how we can connect better and how we can share better and how we can learn better so that we can do better. It's going to be a group before I conclude, something else that crossed my desk last week, and I chuckled because I knew exactly where I would put it on this talk. There was a university professor in America who <coughs> had a grad student to talk to his students. And I guess the grad student was, I think, maybe overseas, so they can only talk to the grad student by email. And halfway through the term, the professor revealed that, in fact, he was using Watson as the teaching assistant. 
It was, I think it was a course on AI, so students probably should have expected that. So, your job on the email out there. Mm -hmm. I want to give you a flavor of what I think that actually looks like. We're going to do a little bit of science fiction for a minute. Maybe we should just call it futurology. <laughs> you all remember the Furby. <laughs> I want you to think about a Furby 10 years from now, which is connected to something very much like Watson, and is always listening to all of the babble the child says from the time they're born and is engaging in conversation with that child, is listening, is learning from that child, the child is learning from it. And as a result, a very deep relationship forms which can actually lead that child into knowledge. Because if the child has a question, in the same way you know, there's a certain age, what is it, like three or four, where all a child has is these questions. Well, less than that is an amazing moment. And we're going to have a tool there that will actually not get exhausted by those questions. <laughs> If we don't make this transition, that tool slowly eases us out. What we need to do is consider that tool as being a core element in our practice and build on top of it. Because we can use the error of knowledge to become 